Yeah, uh, let, let me summarize uh, what all we did in the last class. I think uh, that will give a good picture of this whole procedure for nonlinear uh, finite element analysis. Okay, let us start with I, I hope all of you understand what we mean by load step, okay, time step. Load step and time step are synonymous. I said that uh, that is very important to understand because uh, you will see that um, in many of the softwares you will get messages in the sense that a time step not sufficient, minimum time step attained. This kind of messages is what you will get. Okay, do you want to specify the minimum time step and so on. Okay, so you should understand that what he really means is that when he says minimum time step attained, convergence not attained. This is something like a message that may come up. Many people do not understand this message. What it really means is that he has gone to give a minimum time step in sense that minimum load that is possible. I told you yesterday itself that we are going to uh, split the load okay, into a number of smaller and smaller loads. So what the software means to say is that he has reached the minimum possible, say 10 to the power of minus 8 Newton. He says that he has reached that and still there is no convergence, that is what he means. Okay? So both of them are synonymous. I will. I, I will I will elaborate the point once we go through these steps. Right. So the first thing that you do as soon as you start the uh, finite element analysis or before you start it, as an input, you give what is the delta t, initial, I would say initial delta t or initial load step. Right? I already told you that we are going to normalize the time to 1 which means that when I say initial load step of say delta t say, let me say that this is a not, not, not 1. Okay? Seconds and all have no meaning, you can say seconds, it, it has no, literally has no meaning. What I mean to say is, in my first step apply this multiplied by the total load, you apply this, that is what it means. Okay? You apply not, not, not 1 into f. So, in other words, okay, there is a, a distribution is something like this between the time and the load. Okay? So, the total load say f is reached when time equal to 1. So, you can also view it like this that the total load f is reached when the time is equal to 1. So, when I say the initial time step is not, not, not 1, what I mean to say is the first load that you are going to apply is that multiplied by the total load that I have given. Is it clear? Okay. So, let me get into the loop. See, there are three loops in fact, there are three loops to if you want to look at it in nonlinear finite element. One loop is the incremental loop. Okay? That is the first loop. The second loop which is inside is an iterative loop. Sometimes we use an, an algorithm to do stress update, I am come to I will come to that and there will be a stress update loop. many softwares today use what we call as implicit algorithm for stress update. So, there is one more loop inside. We may not have time to go into stress update for plastic, uh, plasticity and so on. Uh, at least for 1D I will do it. I may not have time to do it for, um, for other cases. 
Okay, but nevertheless, I want you to understand that there are three loops. Now, what does it mean? Look at the time that is going to be involved in doing a problem. You can straight away compare this with an elastic problem. Elastic problem, just one loop, that's it. Okay, just to put f is equal to 10,000 and run the problem, that's all. Everything you calculate in one go. Now, look at that. You have to increment, and inside every increment, you have to iterate. And inside every iteration, you have to do a stress update, that itself which is very inward. Especially when you go to plasticity, stress update itself is inward. So you have this kind of three layers. What is the result of this? The result is that we require very powerful systems, or the time required to run this kind of problems are quite high. So that is what gets out of this kind of nonlinear analysis, that you need much more powerful systems and the time taken to run a problem is also very high. Is it clear? Okay. Now, let us come back and look at these loops here. What I have done is I have essentially summarized what we did yesterday, uh, so that uh, you can look at it more closely. So, the first thing what we do is see whether time t is equal to 1 or in other words, what does it mean? It means whether I have exhausted I have exhausted all my load, right. Initially, of course, I am not going to be exhausted. I would not, I would not have exhausted the load, right. So, I, if it is exhausted, stop the program. You are, you are through with it. If not, get into the big loop, outside loop, incremental loop, okay. From here starts the incremental loop. So, I say n is equal to n plus 1 and T n plus 1 is equal to T n plus delta T n, not this delta T n. That means, that delta T is not a constant. Many softwares does a small optimization of delta T n. In fact, here you may see that delta T n is, is equal to delta T n minus 1 into beta. They would do something like this. A beta is a factor, say 1, 1 1.5 and so on. Beta is also another factor, I will come to that uh, later, but let me say that the first thing, first lesson is that the time step may not or will not be a constant in most of the softwares and that the time steps are adjusted so that we reach the total load in the shortest time. Because when I start, I may not know whether it is going to converge or, or in other words, even when you start, it is going to be difficult for convergence to take place. So, what we usually do is, we start with a very conservative estimate. We start with say not, not, not phi or something like this. But later, when we pick up, okay, we will realize that the time steps can be increased. This also may be, please note this carefully, this may also be due to the nature of the stress strain curve. Okay. This also is due to the nature of stress strain curve. It is, in other words, it is not that when I start with low value, I can immediately jump. It, I may not be able to jump also. Okay. If, if it is going to be an elastoplastic problem, for example, what will happen? Initially, it is going to be elastic. Assume that everything is elastic, then my time steps can be larger. Okay. K t is not going to change. It is something like solving an elastic problem. So, there is no problem. I will get convergence in two steps, keep on going. But when I go come to plastic region, then this may not be the case. I have to cut down because the tangent stiffness may vary. This is what we have seen from the 1D curve itself. And in which case, I have to give a variable time step and the time steps will get adjusted depending upon the rate of convergence. Is it clear? That is why people give a variable time step. So, T n plus 1 is equal to T n plus delta T n, updating the time step. Then I calculate F n plus 1. F n plus 1 is the load at the n plus 1th step. That is the total load multiplied by delta T n. Okay? When I, then that is the, that is the start of the big loop then I am getting into the iterative loop. Next loop is the iterative loop, right? Is there any questions? Is it clear? Okay. 
Now, I will start in the iterative loop. When I start into the iterative, I go into the iterative loop, obviously my error is nothing but the norm. I, I told you that this is what is called as the norm, the last class itself. My, my error norm is the same as that of the load norm. Clear? Okay. f n plus 1 oh okay 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 sorry yeah yeah what what's the question f n plus 1 is equal to f n 2 p n plus 1 minus p n plus yeah. f n no 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 please note that f n plus 1 is the increase is the load that is applied during this step do you understand if i, I i'll just plot i'll just put that yesterday's stress strain curve here simple stress strain curve, say suppose like stress strain curve is something like this or load deflection curve is something like this, okay. We are moving from here to here that is at n, that is at n plus 1, that is for the one dimensional case f n plus 1 or delta f if you, can, if you want to call it or f n plus 1. So, initially that is the f n plus 1. Is that clear? Okay, so initially, initially, this stress which is within the element, okay, will not be able to equilibrate. Obviously, this f n plus one because that is good enough only to equilibrate the total load at n. Please note that it is good enough to equilibrate only the total load at n. So the error, which is the difference between externally applied to the internally generated loads, would obviously be equal to f n plus one. Okay. So, I start with that as the error and get into the iterative loop. Please note this carefully, right. Okay. Now, I get into the iterative loop. So, I calculate first the, first the tangent stiffness, note that, get that. So, first I calculate the tangent stiffness. Now, how do I calculate the tangent stiffness, what I did yesterday? So, I have just written down what all I did yesterday as the tangent stiffness. Then what is the next step? What is the, please note, please look at that, what all we did yesterday. Okay, have a look at that. No, you do not jump, the displacement is comes after two steps. I calculate the error, okay, because that is going to be my right hand side. Okay. Then I calculate the displacements, that is delta u, del u, okay. this is for one increment. Okay. Is this clear? So, I calculate del u. After this, what am I going to do? I am going to add, note this step carefully, I am going to add all this delta u's in the iterations okay all the delta use of this iterations i'm going to add to get delta u inside this iterative loop okay is that clear so this is the total delta u till now inside the iterative loop then i calculate delta epsilon See, note this carefully, this is a very important step. Okay. We do not, I have to calculate delta sigma, but I do not calculate delta sigma from delta epsilon. No. What is the difference between del epsilon, let me call this as del epsilon and delta epsilon. What is the difference between the two? What is the difference between the two? You just note that, what is the difference between delta epsilon and del epsilon? Sorry, del epsilon and delta epsilon. Del epsilon comes from del u. Sigma of del u's are delta u. Okay. So, if you want to look at it figuratively or I mean through a picture, 
what, I, what we mean is, suppose it's something like this. I am here, again, same thing. Solve it. This is del u, okay? Tell you for the first iteration. So, 1. Then again from here I go, this is del u 2. Is it clear? And delta u 2 is this. Sum of this plus this. That is equal to delta u 2. So, del u 2 <coughs> and delta u 2, there is a difference. Are things clear? Any questions? Fine. Now, from delta u 2 or delta u i plus 1, calculate delta epsilon. Okay? Or it does not matter whether you calculate from here. It, it does not matter, but you have to be very careful. Okay? B into delta u, you keep adding. Anyway, you calculate delta epsilon. So, please note, I am interested in this only, not this. Because, look at the next step, update the stress. Look at the way the stress is updated. The stress is updated from actually at converge stress at n, sorry, not n plus 1, converge stress at n plus delta sigma, okay? delta sigma being arrived at from delta epsilon. Is that clear? Now, what is the difference? What am I trying to say? See, for example, I will just write it here. For example, I could get sigma from the two ways in which I could get sigma. From sigma converged, what is sigma converged? That is sigma at n, th that is this here. That is sigma at n, this is, this is the place. Last step it had converged there, okay? n, right? I can, I mean, I will remove all this and note it again. That is the sigma, sigma at that place. See, I can say that sigma converged plus delta sigma at the end of the first iteration plus delta sigma at the end of second and so on. I can write it like this also. Sorry, del sigma, I mean, I am sorry that delta and del, there is a small confusion, del sigma 1 plus del sigma 2 and so on. I can write it like that, right? Del sigma 1 being calculated from del epsilon 1, del sigma 2 calculated from del epsilon 2 and so on. Is it clear? Okay. But we do not do like this. Okay. We do not do like that. But what we do is instead of this, I remove this and put this as delta sigma, delta sigma being calculated only from delta epsilon. So, delta sigma say at i plus 1th iteration is calculated from delta epsilon only. Okay. Basically, this is a very important point that you have to note. Why do you think, let me ask you a question, why uh, you understand now the two ways in which I can update the stress, okay? one through del sigma, another through delta sigma through delta epsilon. Why do you think I, I, I favor this? No, much more important, physically much more important than that. Please note that my, my del sigmas, del sigmas are not, are not actually physically realizable quantity. They are, they come out from my approximate calculations, 
okay what has a meaning is only the converged stress and converged stress okay converged stress has to be updated only ultimately when i calculate like this del sigma 1 del sigma 1 has no meaning right it has no meaning right now so i don't have that path but i calculate completely the del sigma okay if you do in the other fashion if you do uh, if you do through del sigma instead of delta sigma if you do if you do like this then you get into what we call a spurious oscillations and you get into all sorts of troubles okay so the next step seventh step is stress update of course when you are using a package this is done internally uh, by a package but if you keep getting i mean uh, I, the non linear analysis is one where i i won't say that every package is very good and so on but if you keep getting in a package some oscillation of stress then rest assured that they have made a mistake somewhere here okay there are good chances i don't want to name packages but but there are good chances that there may be an error in the stress update algorithm in which case there can be an oscillation and then you get into all sorts of troubles so that's an important step so seven step is stress update so once i know once i update the stress the eighth stress st step is to look for convergence how do you look for convergence very simple now calculate now that i have got my new chap sigma okay i have to now see whether he is able to battle the outside external force that has been applied if the internal force the battle is over when the internal force is or is good enough to equilibrate the external forces so i calculate the error and compare it with the original error multiplied by some tolerance which is say 10 to the power of minus 6 okay so i calculate that yeah any any questions clear okay so now where are we we are in this loop we are in this loop we went inside the loop here came out okay and we are in the iterate increment uh, sorry iterative loop inside the incremental loop right and with that we if the convergence is attained we go to the go out of the loop we, if the convergence is there then on when convergence is there i come out into the other loop right so i go to my initial step and see whether i've completed the problem okay is it clear any questions on it okay now you know how to run it given a problem you know how to run it the only thing i want is that i'll stop with this the general procedure but i want two things i want to do two things one is for a simple say a truss element i want you to calculate the stiffness matrix just have a feel and we will short we, we will discuss in short the issues and stress sub Okay, with that we will close the nonlinear analysis. Right? See what we have actually said is for small strain. Well, for large strain, the procedure is exactly the same. It's not going to be any different. But the strain displacement matrices and all that will change. So the B matrix would change. There will be a nonlinear term, there will be a linear term, and so on. Okay? So the procedure, whether it is geometrically nonlinear or geometrically plus materially nonlinear or materially nonlinear or contact what whatever it is the procedure is exactly the same okay this is how it is done but stiffness matrix may change load may change okay because when there is contact or 
stress update may change when you move from one material to the other and so on, but the procedure, the overall procedure remains the same. Is it clear? Okay. Now, I will give you this exercise. Please see in the next 5 minutes, let us see whether you are able to get me the stress update, uh, sorry, uh, the stiffness matrix for a truss element. Okay. If you want, you just look at these steps and see whether you are able to do it. So, what is that you require now? Uh, if, if, if you want, our good old friend, the stiffness matrix for a truss element I have also written. Okay. Looking at it, I want you to say what it is. You can, you can very easily say this, it is not a big problem. No one, I, I am not interested to, for you to go through the truth, but nevertheless, I want an important point. The isoparametric concept, please note this carefully, the isoparametric concept which I had introduced for plane strain, plane stress, axisymmetric, solid okay, or of course, we have not talked about shell and so on. All this concept of isoparametric element is obviously applicable for this. Okay. The procedure for calculating stiffness matrix, the natural coordinate system, the integration and all those things are applicable here. Okay. And we have to, when, we, when it comes to this, uh, the elastoplastic analysis, I will say that okay in a uh, in a minute let me finish this there are some issues that is also very important here so i want to i want you to calculate the truss for a nonlinear problem now for a nonlinear problem what do you think you have to do for a truss element hey, it's very simple you need not think so much what is that you should do? Fantastic. So, E is not a constant. So, the attack is right on E. Fine. Then, attack is on E, right. Then, so what do you do with E? Pardon? Take it inside. Why do you want to take it inside the matrix? E is not a constant. That is very good. This is the stiffness matrix K, but that is not a constant. So, you have to attack that fellow. D E P I have put there. You know, if you look at that my, uh, my steps there, B transpose D E P B I have put. So, what do you do with this? D, what is DEP in, in a uniaxial case? We are, we are looking at uniaxial case. EP is plastic, uh, okay, D nonlinear, whatever you want to call it. So, what is E now? No, what is D? Okay, what is what did I call DEPS yesterday? D sigma by D epsilon. Remember that I said that that is the Jacobian. I, sometimes people call this as Jacobian and d sigma by d epsilon. I call, I, I said that la, uh, in the last class, right. So, what is, what is that you will replace E by? Uh, that is all, there is nothing there, you know, d, I will carry, I will replace it by what we call as tangent modulus, say E t, that is all. So, in other words, the one dimensional equivalent of d e p is E t, which is d sigma by d epsilon. One dimensional equivalent of it is d sigma by d epsilon. Now, how do you calculate this for say, for example, an elastoplastic analysis? 
what are the assumptions that you will make? There are a number of assumptions. I, I don't think we need to go into it. But only thing, one of the major assumptions is that d epsilon is equal to d epsilon e plus d epsilon p. Or in, in other words, total strain can be split into an elastic part and a plastic part. Okay, and so that dividing by d sigma throughout that is 1 by E t is equal to 1 by E plus 1 by h prime. h prime is d sigma by d epsilon p. Is it clear? Okay. So, you can calculate E t from simply this equation. This h prime is obtained from experiments. Okay and that is nothing but d sigma by d epsilon p. Suppose I give sigma is equal to some k epsilon p power n, say for example, I give a sigma is equal to k epsilon p power n, then you can easily calculate the stiffness matrix from such a equation. I am not going to go into the details of DEP for a multi-axial case, but I just want you to understand that the calculations are very similar. Okay. Only thing is equations involved are very much higher. Is it, is it clear? Okay. Uh, can you expand on E t a bit? Let us see what, what you get out of it. From that equation, I want you to, I wa uh, can, can you tell me more about E t from that equation? In fact, you can write E t as E minus E divided by E plus h prime. No. E into 1 minus 1 by E plus h prime, something like that you can write. So, which means that there is a loss of the stiffness due to plastic strains. Okay. Uh, that anyway, that is a simple say some jugglery that you can do and get to the final step. Okay. Is, is this clear? Any questions on it? Any questions on it? On whatever we have done? Okay. So, the only thing that remains for me is stress update algorithm. I am not going to the details of it because as I told you it is very involved and so just I want to, issue, uh, I want to tell you certain issues that are involved. Okay. No, there are, uh, I, if, if you want to really look at stress update algorithm, we have to study what we call as plasticity theory. For, for example, for plastic analysis. Okay. If it is a nonlinear elasticity, then it is straightforward. D sigma can be updated straight away from, say, D nonlinear. So just call it as D E P, you can call it as D nonlinear. You can just say straight away you can update it. Okay. But in plasticity, you cannot do this because you have to satisfy what we call as consistency condition and other things. Even here you may have problems, but as a first approximation, this may be better. So, in other words, stress update algorithm is very crucial. A lot of research has been done because that algorithm should be such that okay, it should satisfy the updating should satisfy conditions called consistency. Okay. That, that is, in other words, what it really means is that when I have a stress strain curve, for a particular strain, I have only one stress. Okay, I cannot have multiple stresses or I cannot have a stress which is above or somewhere like that. I, can, I have to lie always on the stress strain curve, okay, which means that I have to be consistent in the stress strain relationship 
and so stress update algorithm should satisfy consistency. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think we will stop with that as far as the stress update algorithm is concerned. You can't do much in uh, in this course, but when you when you really read uh, a, a literature or a package uh, manuals, you can understand stress update means that he is updating the stress at this point. See, apart from all this, there are a lot of other issues in nonlinearities. See, many uh, many um, materials, say whether it's elastoplastic or rubber, which is of course a nonlinear uh, solid. Okay, has other very important properties. For example, they are many of them are incompressible. For example, rubber is incompressible. Okay, in the plastic region, for plastic strains, the material, the metals are incompressible. Or in other words, they are nearly incompressible if you take elastic and plastic strains into considerations. Okay, so the other things apart from satisfying convergence and other things you also have to satisfy what we call as volume conservancy. Okay, volume has to be conserved. This is done by so many means. For example, people use penalty function approach. Okay, again, it is a big topic, but nevertheless, what I want to tell is that many softwares take care of this, but there are many algorithms that <coughs> attack this problem of volume conservancy. Is it clear? So, that is one thing that is that again makes the problem very intricate and that is one thing which makes the problem difficult as well. Okay? Now, there is one more issue which, uh, which people have not, uh, not pointed out, but I would like you to see do it looking at this equation. Because there are a lot of nice things that uh, that you can get physically looking at equations. Look at that A e by L, E I have now replaced by E t, everyone agreed, but you all kept quiet after that. But look at that equation and comment on my observation. Right. In other words, we are in the nonlinear path. How do you say that A is the same? What is the A? A you will start with one A initially and then you will keep going with A, but you can always say that look, I am not very happy with that equation, you have to do something with A. Where do you get this concept from? From your engine, fantastic. So, it is from true stress and engineering stress or nominal stress. So, you will, you will immediately you can react that what, what happens to this and this, right? Okay. For a small, I mean for an elastic problem, it is fine we are not worried about, we do not apply true stress for an elastic problem. We will keep A itself, A is equal to A 0, we call it in other courses. But in this particular case, we are looking at plasticity and are we justified in saying A and L, we will take the initial area as an initial line? No. Okay. Now, when you start touching that part A and L, then we are into what? into geometric nonlinearity. So, when I touch both this fellows as well as wonder whether A and L are the same guys as I started with, then I am in the realm of geometric nonlinearities. Then I have lot more issues now. Then what do I do with A and L? I am now in the incremental stage. So, do I keep updating my A and L as I move in the increments? Okay. I go to say first step, I then update my, my A 0 to A 1, update my L 0 to L 1 and so on. So, do I keep updating like this is my next question. Yes, you can update like that or in other words, you get a new reference for your problem or for your geometry and in which case for the geometrically nonlinear problem, you are following a technique called updated Lagrangian. Okay. 
So in updated Lagrangian technique, which is followed for a geometrically nonlinear problem, it can also have material nonlinearity. When I have material nonlinearity and geometric nonlinearity, I'll worry about all these terms here, geometry as well as the ET. Right? I'll worry about all the fellows there. Okay? So in that kind of problem, either I start with the reference, I apply a load, say delta F1 after the first step, then I will update my A, L and so on okay? and then go ahead, keep on updating so that my reference configuration, my reference configuration keeps getting updated as I move or march in the time steps. If that is the case, then I follow what is called as updated Lagrangian. But if I do not do not do that, okay, I am I'm still okay because the way you now define stress, strain and all are different. You go to a large stress, I mean a large strain, different types of stress and so on. If, if my reference configuration is the same as A0 and L0, okay, but calculate my stress, strain and all the other factors with respect to my old reference configuration, then I follow what is called as total Lagrangian. See, please do not con get confused between updated Lagrangian, total Lagrangian and the Lagrangian elements okay, uh, or uh, Lagrangian that is used for calculating the stiffness matrix and so on. Please do not get confused between the two. They are different. Okay? This is an updated Lagrangian, total Lagrangian for geometrically nonlinear problems which states how you are going to update the configurations. Total Lagrangian. See, suppose this is the this is the body. Okay. Now, after the first step, I apply the loads. There is some boundary conditions and so on. After the first step or first increment, my body is something like this. Okay. I have some coordinates here. Okay. Now, if I now update the coordinates according to the displacements and keep this as my reference right? and go to the next step. So that deformation is say something like this. I, I update my configuration here and go to the next step and so on. Okay? So I, what, is, what do I do actually? I keep updating my reference configurations. See, in a, in a, in a much cruder fashion, what it means, it's not what I say is not correct, but I, uh, but it gives you a good picture. What I mean to say is, okay, I calculate first stress. Okay, now I calculate say sigma. Say let let me take a bar. I apply the load. Okay, after the first increment, I get some sigma. So after the next increment, in order to calculate sigma, and in order to do all those things, I use a one and l one. Okay, which is what I obtained after the first increment. Okay, so that I will then I will calculate some delta sigma based on a one l one. Right? Then a one l one is my then I'll go to a two l two. Okay. Then in order to go to the next increment a three l three, I will use a two l two as my reference. Right? So if I keep updating my reference, I, have, I would have forgotten A0, L0. I will go to A1, L1. From there, I will move to next. I will move to the next one and so on. Okay? If I keep updating my reference, roughly speaking, that is what we call as updated Lagrangian. Okay? But if I say that, no, no, I do not want to update like this, my intermediate configurations I have no interest. Even when I go to the next step, my reference is only this. Okay? And I will work on techniques in such a fashion that my reference does not change. Then I am in I am following what is called as total Lagrangian. Now what do I do? Actually it is it is something like the way I handle stress. Okay? The, for example, for example, 
the, st the stress that you may handle okay, for updated Lagrangian would be sigma that is the that is close to true stress. Okay. But the stress that you may handle in total Lagrangian may be close to the nominal stress. But I will make adjustments in my strains and so on such a fashion that I do not come consider. In other words, in other words, the difference between total and updated Lagrangian is mathematical. It is not, not uh, there is nothing uh, to do with the error in the finite element program okay, or the error in procedure. It is only mathematical. So, only a configuration, reference configuration, but I will adjust my stress definition, strain definition in such a fashion that I take into account this thing is at the back of my mind, what is my reference. Okay. So, updated Lagrangian, total Lagrangian does not mean that I have some error. Though there are claims that updated Lagrangian is much more natural than total Lagrangian in elastoplastic analysis and so on, but mathematically both of them are very rigorous. Right. So, these are the two procedures that are used for, when are they used? Please note this, when we have both material as well as geometric nonlinearity. Okay. So, that is a, uh, that is a short excursion into nonlinear analysis, right. Is it clear? And I know that I have, uh, though I have put lot of mathematics, it's not, it's not very rigorous because uh, the updated total Lagrangian and all are mathematically very intense. We are not going into the details of it. At, at least I want you to know these names because that will be very helpful when you run uh, using a package a nonlinear problem. Because as I said, as far as nonlinearity is concerned, this the cons the aim of the course is not to make you develop codes, you know that is not, that is not my aim. To appreciate at least first linear part, yes I would like you to go to an extent of even developing a code, but as far as non-linear part is concerned, at least you should appreciate what are the terminologies, how things are done, okay, what is convergence, what is time step and all that, okay, how things are done so that you will be able to handle a problem, a non-linear problem. Okay using a software or a package. Okay, we will meet in the next class.